Thank you all for coming back after the break. <laughs> I'm Chris Schrader. I'm a faculty member here at the law school, and I've been uh, just delighted to be uh, sitting in a chair with the rest of you all for the last couple of days, learning a great deal about various facets of uh, the court of public opinion from the wonderful panels that we've had so far. And uh, I think the rest of the day promises to be just as interesting and informative. The session uh, now uh, is going to uh, examine uh, some of what we know, that not, not something that I know, but people who study uh, cognition and, and media and communications policy know about how the framing of news, the vocabulary that news uses in describing stories uh, has an effect on how people perceive the news. We've had uh, a number of people reference the fact that in uh, the court of public opinion, uh, perception becomes reality. Well, how is that perception formed uh, by virtue of the different ways that news is framed and then communicated? And as I say, people who study cognition and work in the media studies areas uh, have done a number of experiments and uh, d gathered data. And, and there are some things that we know. I'm sure that they would all tell you there's lots that we still don't know, especially uh, in making the important next step into how people will translate those perceptions into actions that they take that are of some significance, like how they vote on juries. How, how much can distorted stories be negated by good jury instructions? We know a little bit less about that kind of thing. Uh, but we're here today to learn some from Kim Gross, who's an associate professor at George Washington University in um, media and public policy. Uh, and uh, who has uh, done a preliminary paper with her colleague Bob Entman, who regrets not being able to be here today. Uh, the final version of that will be appearing in the proceedings of the conference. I'm going to ask her to lead off uh, both, uh, as I say, giving us some general sense of um, the way news reporting, particularly of, uh, of crimes, uh, has been studied and, and what researchers have uh, ascertained about people's reactions and how their thought processes receive this kind of information. And then I'll introduce the uh, remaining two panelists after uh, Kim is done. So Kim. Thank you. Um, and thank you for having us here today. Um, and Bob Edmund does apologize for not being able to be here. He was invited to do some journalism training in Nepal and that was hard for him to pass up as well. So um, our paper that we're actually um, writing for the conference actually focuses on media coverage of this particular case. Um, and in that, we argue that there are clearly important lessons to be drawn from this case. But in order to do that, we really have to do a kind of more systematic analysis of coverage and make some um, important distinctions about coverage, some of which were actually suggested um, in the talk of, by Professor Schneider last night. Um, and uh, for example, distinguishing among time periods of coverage. So how does coverage unfold over time? And so does early coverage look uh, like it has a different kind of slant than later coverage? And, and how does that all play together? Distinctions between an, um, opinion and news and, and things of that sort. But uh, before I get to that, I want to talk a little bit um, Actually, I may not even get to that, I should say, uh, my preliminary analysis. Uh, we have some preliminary analysis, which I'm happy to talk about later, um, or if we get to it. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about the general concept of media framing and what sort of researchers know about media framing and it's, uh, how that helps us to understand the potential for media coverage to influence public opinion, and then talk a little bit more about sort of what the normal um, coverage of crime looks like. Uh, in the media as a context into which to set this particular case, because in many ways this particular case is not really the norm on crime coverage. Um, so media framing, um, these are two definitions that I'm a political scientist. Political scientists tend to use a lot and uh, communication scholars tend to use a lot about what do we mean by media framing. You can see their definitions offered up here. Frames as a central organizing idea or storyline that provides meaning to that unfolding strip of events telling us what the controversy is about or the essence of the issue. Or uh, Bob Entman's definition, uh, which talks about uh, selecting aspects of perceived reality to make them more salient in a communicating text. So frames provide a particular way of thinking about or understanding an issue. And this idea is sort of um, familiar to us. Uh, but just to take a kind of current example, domestic wiretapping could be about terrorist surveillance. Or it could be about civil liberties and breaking the law. And depending on which of those frames carries the day in media coverage, we might imagine that the public will tend to be more or less supportive of uh, domestic wiretapping and uh, provisions uh, the government wants to use. 
A key premise of the framing literature then is that frames by highlighting certain aspects of a policy or an event are going to lead the audience to um, predictable feelings and thoughts uh, and lead them to kind of predictable conclusions in terms of their opinions. And um, in general, what we find, oh, I should also note, frames enter uh, media coverage right in a couple of ways. One, they enter through the kinds of uh, storytelling devices that journalists want to use, right? So the journalist will pull in a storytelling device, right? So setting the Duke lacrosse case in the context of this is a story about race and privilege, or this is a story about um, students, uh, as privileged student athletes. But they also come in through um, the attempts of uh, journalists to sort of pull in the elite debate. So what are various parties um, saying? And this means, of course, that various parties have an incentive right, to get their preferred frame inserted in media coverage. Um, and some parties are better positioned to do that um, by virtue of a variety of things related to the particular um, uh, policy issue or event. And then also some frames are easier to get into coverage, either because they um, resonate culturally or they uh, follow a kind of standard script that the media uses and thinks is the appropriate script in this particular context. So. Uh, so what we know, uh, numerous studies, mostly using experimental methods, um, have demonstrated that framing effects matter, that we can find in, experimental, in an experimental context that uh, sort of systematically different ways of uh, telling a story does influence opinion, right? It leads people, if you give people a kind of one-sided, slanted perspective, it does move opinion in a kind of persuasive direction in the direction you would expect it to. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, work that tells us that. Um, but we also have, and I think a sort of this is the more recent work in, uh, in communication on framing, a lot of work that tells us that there's also limits to this, right? That we should remember that the media is not all powerful, right? But it, it's, it's limited in important ways. So these are things that seem perfectly obvious and predictable in some ways. Uh, what people judge to be weak arguments don't move them very well. Uh, source credibility matters. The exact same information presented from what's perceived as a credible source and what's perceived as a not credible source, uh, you see very different uh, reactions to that. Also, frames that are inconsistent with your predispositions aren't very likely to move you. In fact, you can kind of counter-argue them, right? This is a point, uh, related to a point Professor Snyder was bringing up last night about how the same person, two different people can see the exact same information and depending on their own kind of basic understanding of the world, they'll read that information very differently. They'll see it as uh, slanted in different ways. And then last, uh, uh, competitive framing matters, right? That a lot of those original studies which really showed sort of what people took to be rather dramatic media effects really used these kind of one-sided stories, but a lot of coverage is not particularly one-sided. It's often competitive. So in the normal context in uh, political stories, you often get right the Democratic and Republican perspective. Right, You get a kind of two-sided perspective. Uh, from the perspective of a media researcher, right, there's two things that we want to take away from this research that's relevant for uh, what we're talking about here at this conference. One is the potential for media frames to influence opinion and influence how the public thinks suggests we probably should be wary, potentially, of pretrial publicity. Uh, we don't know for sure, right, that there aren't ways we can uh, mitigate against that, but we want to be wary. Um, but also that there are limits to these effects and limits that might be kind of important. A um, couple of things uh, on that point is, one, that news norms um, are such that without contending elites uh, trying to impose different kinds of frames or, or arguing up, uh, offering up different sort of perspectives, coverage uh, often ends up to be one-sided, right, and then arguably is um, going to be sort of unfair to at least some of those participants. Um, and so to the degree that balance uh, in the news often depends on having these kind of reliable, legitimate, and credible sources who are offering kind of competing alternative narratives or promoting competing alternative narratives, we can imagine that pretrial publicity is a case where we're going to run into more problems potentially because it has, it seems, more potential to be one-sided. Right? Either because one side is not speaking, because journalists have more ready access to uh, law enforcement as sources, right? so they're going to end up with a more pro-prosecution bias. In general, it seems that sort of coverage of uh, crime tends to have uh, this kind of pro-prosecution bias. It tends to treat the presumption of innocence as uh, a formality, 
use the word allege, but not give you a kind of broader context that makes clear that law enforcement personnel can make mistakes, the district attorney or the prosecutor can mis make mistakes, they might have political motives. That, that is not necessarily the norm in crime coverage to sort of give that kind of balance. And of course that is, that imbalance is of course facilitated as well by the fact that I think the general public thinks when someone's been indicted and they've been arrested, there's a reason that happened, right? That inclines toward a kind of presumption of guilt even in the absence of Nai Fong standing up and saying, you know, what he said. Uh, so there, you already have that presumption. Uh, now, I do also want to set this in the context of uh, more other crime coverage and what we know about crime coverage more generally. And the normal case in crime coverage um, is in some respects uh, different than what we saw here. It's a largely unintentional slant that reinforces uh, white antagonism toward black defendants, uh, generally equating uh, African Americans, often uh, people of color and particularly African Americans, with crime and danger. So it uh, perpetuates, and this particularly comes out of local news, which turns out to be most people's main source of news. Most people still say their main source of news is local television news. And that looks particularly problematic when we consider the fact that local television news is dominated by crime coverage and violent crime in particular is given more play than you would warrant by looking at crime statistics. So it perpetuates what um, uh, political scientists Franklin Gilliam and Shanto Anger have called a crime script in which crime is violent and perpetrators are black. Um, on this, uh, just some examples of uh, the over-representation of violent crime in local television news. Um, there's a whole host of this. Basically, it leads the news, right? If it bleeds, it leads. Totally applies to local television news, right? It's a serious problem in local television news. Um, but then, uh, more to the point here, what is the sort of racialized aspect of this? And what we find in uh, looking at a variety of uh, studies is that, in general, it has this racialized aspect in which it sort of uh, <coughs> looks uh, as though it associates black defendants, uh, blacks with crime and violence, right? So African Americans are twice as likely as whites in one study, uh, white defendants to be subjected to negative pretrial publicity, Latinos three times as likely as whites uh, to receive negative pretrial publicity. African Americans and Latinos are more likely to appear as lawbreakers than whites, also more likely to appear as perpetrators than they are to appear as victims, right? And um, they are more likely, African Americans in particular, are overrepresented as perpetrators of violent crime in a variety of studies which have tried to match this against the crime rates, the arrest, using the arrest rates in the particular community that they're looking at the television news from. So uh, sort of disproportionate representation. Whites, by contrast, are overrepresented as victims of violence or as law enforcement officers, while blacks are underrepresented in those more sympathetic roles. And then uh, work by Bob Edmond has found that they're also, African Americans are also more likely to be shown um, as more symbolically threatening. They're more likely to have a mugshot uh, used in the local television news, more likely it's shown under physical restraint of the police. Um, I'm just going to... This is uh, one example. I'll just skip over this quickly, but of uh, this overrepresentation. Um, this is from some work looking at Los Angeles uh, local news. And what you can see is that they do overrepresent uh, the television perpetrators, are sort of the crime news coverage. Uh, the arrest rate is what we see for the arrest rate from Los Angeles and Orange County. And what you see is that they overrepresent black perpetrators. Um, so what might be the potential effects of such coverage? Um, there's a lot of work looking at content. There's just a little bit less work looking at potential effects, but some has been done. Um, again, experimental work. Um, and what it suggests is that um, <clears throat> there is a potential, that this news coverage does kind of inculcate into uh, people's heads this kind of association between right, race and violence in ways that um, are, are potentially uh, worrisome. So, uh, for example, um, in some work uh, by Shanto Iyengar and uh, Franklin Gilliam, they show people local news coverage uh, in which they've uh, subtly altered the exact same murder story, but in one they show you um, an African American as the defendant, in another they show you a white as the defendant. Uh, <coughs> those who are shown the African American defendant are um, much more likely to, or 
uh, somewhat more likely, significantly more likely, to support increased, they're, they're more punitive about their crime policy views, right? They're more likely to say that we should uh, have three strikes you're out legislation. They want to put more police on the street. They want to, um, they, they're also more supportive of the death penalty. When shown that black, uh, that same story with an African American uh, as the uh, uh, alleged perpetrator. Then when they're shown that white is the alleged perpetrator at the exact same story, you don't get that sort of effect relative to no crime story. Um, another one that I think is kind of striking, uh, and we see this in other places, racial sentiments are strongly supported for, uh, related to support for the death penalty. Um, another one that I think is quite striking is some work by uh, so social psychologist Josh Carell, where he's looked at um, uh, having people uh, partake in what they perceive to be just sort of computer games. But what they are is a computer game in which you are asked to shoot an armed target, but not an unarmed target. And the uh, target individual is either black or white. They're shown in a kind of realistic background. And they're either uh, holding a gun or not holding a gun. And what they find is under time pressure, participants are more likely to mistakenly shoot the unarmed black target and uh, more likely to mistakenly not shoot the unarmed the armed white target than the black, armed black target, right? So again, the notion here, right, would be that this kind of television coverage, right, which perpetuates a certain kind of racial schema about crime is going to be um, having an effect in such that it, it inculcates into people's heads this image, right, and it has these potential consequences in the world. Um, what we want to suggest is that these uh, this kind of uh, normal crime coverage, right, suggests that the problem, the more general problem of prejudicial pretrial publicity, right, is going to be magnified in the case of black defendants who also then suffer from this potential um, that they have this added kind of racial stereotype that people bring that's also inclining them toward a kind of notion of guilt um, in association with violence. I don't know why I'm on time. About three, four more minutes. Um, Okay, uh, well then I'll just say really quickly about a couple of things that we're looking at in our um, analysis of the, the coverage here. Um, our initial analysis is, it, uh, at this point, somewhat preliminary. Um, three things we think are important to distinguish in the coverage is the early coverage versus the later coverage. In particular, we're interested in sort of how coverage changed once the, the initial DNA results get released, because we think that's a moment at which the case should have unraveled. Knife long perpetuated, but it's also a moment at which seemingly journalists had another signal there that might have allowed them to sort of pick up on and start to at least be more critical themselves, pay more attention themselves. So do we see a sort of distinction from before and after? Uh, also distinguishing among media outlets, and this was touched on yesterday in the media panels, um, we want to think differently about print and broadcast in these cable talk shows. Um, we don't consider the cable talk shows news. <laughs> their entertainment. Now, <laughs> that's, that's a problem in part because in at least our preliminary look, of course, the worst offenders here are the, the commentators, the editorialists, these cable talk shows. Now, from one perspective, we don't want to damn the media by painting them the broad brush if it turns out straight news stories look different. On the other hand, to the degree that the general public can't distinguish those people from news, or to the degree that those commentators actually influence how then journalists are thinking about that narrative. That is still a problem. So we want to look at those separately, but pay attention to both. And then distinguish um, opinion from commentary, which I've already touched on. Um, and our initial notion is that early coverage does look problematic. What happened in early coverage is that sort of news norms, right? News norms that um, defer to elite official sources right, which become a real problem when the prosecutor has decided to essentially engage in what uh, Nifong has engaged in, uh, news norms which really reinforce uh, the common tendency of the news is to use these kind of stereotypes and standard scripts, right? So they latch onto that stereotype and standard script. And this is probably particularly a problem for the national coverage, right? They've parachuted in. They haven't developed local sources. They don't have other people to talk to, right? And so they tell a certain kind of story about Duke and Durham, right? That doesn't reflect what the reality of Duke and Durham is from the perspective of people who live here. And uh, last but not least, PAC journalism just reinforces that. So, so we see these problems. And we do see in our at least initial look, early coverage looks um, predictably uh, sort of slanted uh, pro-prosecution. Uh, when we take a longer view, it looks more mixed. 
Um, so I'll, and I'll just leave it at that. Great. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, the framing phenomenon is certainly one that uh, <coughs> lots of people who interact with the media are alert to. Uh, it, it, Kim's very first example about the um, NSA a wiretap program. If you recall when uh, Jim Risen of the New York Times broke that story in December of 2005, the New York Times was referring to it as uh, a secret NSA warrantless wiretap program covering millions of Americans. And with de in days, we discovered that the uh, government was calling this the terrorist surveillance program. Right. So it was immediately a contest between the terrorists protecting America from terrorism frame versus the massive violation of civil liberties, uh, liberties frame. So. It's a, it's a common phenomenon, and if, um, if government can be onto it, you can bet that lots of other people are <laughs> as well. Now, Scott Bullock and Steve Shapiro are not criminal attorneys, so they're not going to be directly dealing with the, the literature and uh, findings that Kim has been uh, describing for us. But they are both uh, seasoned uh, senior attorneys. Scott is a senior attorney for the Institute for Justice, and, and Steve is the uh, litigation director of the ACLU, who regularly deal with cases that attract an enormous amount of uh, public and media attention. Um, just two quick examples. Uh, the ACLU is engaged in a number of challenges uh, on civil liberties grounds to various aspects of the administration's policies in the war on terror, including several uh, relating directly to the NSA wiretap program. And uh, Scott most recently has been involved in the Kelo litigation uh, and others, uh, in which attracted a huge amount of national attention. So whether they like it or not, the media is coming to them looking for uh, an understanding of the case. And I think given the panel we had uh, over lunch, if you're a repeat player in this business, if you've been, if you've had the media beat itself to your door and beat that door down once, you quickly learn that the worst strategy is to just be reactive and let things happen. So both of these uh, folks, I think, have some experiences to share about how they go about thinking about the interaction between the justice result they want to achieve in court and the fact that lots of media of all descriptions are suddenly terribly interested in aspects of the case. So we'll start off with Scott and then go to Steve. Thank you, Chris. I, I should just say that as a public interest organization, uh, we like the media knocking down our doors and finding out about our cases. And uh, we, like most other public interest organizations, unapologetically incorporate a media strategy into our litigation. Uh, and that is a part, a vital part of what we see as advancing our mission. And when we describe the work that we do, as a matter of fact, we actually incorporate the name of this conference in that we say that we litigate our cases in the courts of law and the court of public opinion. Now, why do we do that? Well, because in public interest law, you're not just trying to win for your client, but you're seeking to advance the mission of your organization. You were seeking really, in essence, to change the world. And because you were trying to change the world, it is oftentimes an uphill battle. Uh, as our organization and most other organizations have learned, you can lose in court, um, but you can still uh, win in the overall court of public opinion or in other forms in which public interest lawyers uh, engage. Um, and that is a really important aspect of our work. Public interest law is really about the use of litigation and all related means in order to advance the interests of a client and a cause to shape jurisprudence. Uh, now, we've done this, and we actually learned some lessons about this from looking at the experiences of uh, earlier public interest organizations, in particular the ACLU and the NAACP, the two uh, kind of granddaddies of the public interest law movement. Uh, the ACLU, when it was first founded, was called, I think it was the American Union Against Militarism. And it was founded during World War I, where uh, President Wilson was imprisoning those who opposed the, uh, the war. And uh, the uh, American Union lawyers would challenge this in court, these uh, flagrant violations of the Constitution. But they did not just go into court and vindicate their causes. They would have a rally 
out in front of the courthouse to draw attention to the injustice of these imprisonments. They would talk to the press. They would uh, uh, try to engage the public about this. Uh, we do the very same thing uh, today. We have rallies before uh, important city council hearings or before important court hearings. Um, we engage in grassroots uh, activism. Um, and this is a vital part of our, uh, a vital part of our mission. The NAACP also uh, did this, and especially in the early days of uh, their organization, and they uh, also engaged in some grassroots activism, but also did something else that was very important that we also do, which is to engage opinion leaders, to talk to the folks that are shaping public opinion, especially um, given that they were really trying to change public perceptions about this. They wanted to get public um, opinion leaders on their side. Uh, public interest lawyers today also do this. We uh, talk to syndicated columnists that have uh, columns throughout their uh, uh, throughout the country that um, we talk to them about our cases, why our cases are important, why uh, we think they should write a column about uh, uh, our cases. We meet with editorial boards in every uh, area, in every city in which uh, we practice, in every city in which we have a case. We sit down with editorial board uh, editorial boards and talk to them about why we're doing this, why we've come into their community. They, they might not agree with us, but we at least try to engage them and try to work with them and try to see and explain to them why we're doing what we are doing. Um, every summer, we also have a training program where we bring in about 40 law students uh, to Washington to have a seminar about how you do public interest law, either as a career or as a sideline when you're in private practice or doing, or doing pro bono work. Uh, if any law students here are interested in that, you can find out about it on our website at ij.org. Uh, it's a weekend where we talk to them about the history of public interest law, why we're doing what we're doing, um, about how you actually engage in the nuts and bolts of public interest law, how it differs from uh, other practices of law. But we also, as a part of that, training program have an entire session, almost an entire afternoon on working with the media. How you talk to the media. How you talk like a human being and not like a lawyer. <laughs> how you speak clearly. How you, um, how you do, uh, 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 talk passionately. How you do not uh, speak in legalese. Um, and it's very difficult sometimes for law students and oftentimes lawyers to, uh, uh, to do that. We also talk to them about what we call SOCOs. Um, SOCOs stands for Strategic Overriding Communications Objectives. Um, a lot of times people say that these are sound bites. They're not sound bites. Uh, sound bites are something cutesy that uh, you know, a politician says on the floor to get on the nightly news and, and, uh, uh, and to try to get attention. That's not what this is. This is actually a message that you want people to come away from any interview, any reporter, any member of the public, with a message that you are communicating. And you want to incorporate these two or three objectives into any interview uh, that you do. And you have to boil it down, boil a case down to its essence. And we talk to law students about how they can do this and how they can become effective spokespeople uh, for their, uh, for their uh, cases. Um, now, how do we do this? What are, I think, the keys to success, uh, very briefly, is to uh, how you work effectively with the, uh, with the media. Well, one of the things I think it's very important to do and something that I think uh, we've been successful in doing and something that I know makes a lot of lawyers, especially lawyers in private practice, extremely nervous is that you put the client up front. You have the client talk to the media. Suzette Kilo, uh, the person who was the subject of the Supreme Court case, uh, had a wonderful story. Um, and she became the face of that battle. There were other homeowners, other ones that talked to the, to the media. But it was her and her little pink house that was sought by the city of New London uh, to give to private developers. She became the face of this battle. And that was a very important message for, uh, uh, for the media. Um, 
me the media essentially wants that human face because the media is interested in a story they want to tell a story they don't want to he necessarily hear about the public use clause and the 50 years of jurisprudence since the time of the Berman decision you can certainly talk about that to certain audiences but what's going to get public attention is having a client story uh, up front uh, that's what we try to do in our uh, in our litigation um, it also helps, quite frankly, to have a good villain uh, on the other side uh, of this, somebody that you can uh, 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 point to as uh, representing the problems of the particular issue that, uh, uh, that you're engaging in. That also is a story that people can easily uh, relate to. The other thing that we do that I think is very important is that we make it very easy for reporters to find information out about our cases. On our website, we have um, documents on there, not only our news releases, but we have backgrounders that we put together on all of our cases that talk about the history of the case, the history of the legal issues that we're, uh, that, uh, that we're involved in. Um, we try to uh, have as many legal documents up there as well. Not only does this provide the necessary information for reporters, it also um, allows them to become comfortable with who uh, who you are and what you're trying to do. There's no hidden secrets here. There's no um, uh, there's no agenda that you're trying to uh, to. Well, there might be an agenda you're trying to advance, but you're very open about it, and you're not trying to hide information. There's one stop shopping really for reporters when they come to your website and try to find out information. The other thing too that we're very um, uh, adamant about doing is being accessible to the media and having our clients be accessible to the media as well. This is something we've heard from reporters over and over again, is that when they're working on a story about our case, they know that if they call us, they will we'll either speak to them immediately or they'll get a phone call back very quickly. Um, you can't be in a situation, and we tell our lawyers this, our young lawyers all the time, where you say, well, listen, I'm working, I have a hearing tomorrow. I can't speak to the press. I, you know, th I, I can't do this. You know, I have to focus on the actual legal work. No, you definitely have to focus on your actual legal work, but a vital part of this is also getting your message out to the broader, uh, to the broader public. And we also make this an explicit part of our agreement with our clients, too, that we are able to use their image to talk about their cases and that they have to be comfortable speaking to the press. Uh, and we actually uh, t uh, do some media training with them too as to how to make uh, your message more honed as to how you talk to reporters in a more um, uh, in a more uh, uh, accessible way um, this is a very important part of the work that uh, that we do and clients have to be comfortable uh, in uh, in in doing that um, I will I will stop by, by just giving you one example of how we uh, I think effectively use some of these strategies, uh, and that is an issue that Chris had mentioned in our fight against uh, eminent domain abuse. Um, this was an issue that, oftentimes, mainly we got involved in this in the mid 1990s, and it was at a time when. Most people, most lawyers certainly, thought that this issue was essentially a dead letter. Uh, you read about the, the Poultown case maybe in law school or the Berman case from the 1950s and where governments could use eminent domain not only for traditional public uses like roads or bridges or public buildings and that sort of thing, but now for private economic development purposes, taking a neighborhood to build a big box retail store, taking a set of homes to put in high-end uh, condominiums. Um, and we thought that this was outrageous. We thought this was a violation of the, of the Constitution, of both the U.S. Uh, Constitution and, and state constitutions. And we said, listen, the law is very bad in this area, but that's why public interest organizations exist, to take on the hard cases, to take on the uphill, uh, they take on the uphill battle. So we started getting involved in these cases a little bit at a time, and we had the fortune of having as our first case in this area um, a situation that arose in Atlantic City, uh, New Jersey, where um, the government there, the city of Atlantic City, was trying to take the home of Vera Koking an elderly widow who lived along the sea, uh, seashore, uh, lived in a boarding house, there's, ran a boarding house and lived in it for uh, over 30 years. Um, she was really a very sympathetic person. People saw her as, as somebody who could be their grandmother. Um, so 
we took on her case and uh, the city of Atlantic City was taking her property to give to none other than Donald Trump. <laughs> Talk about having a nice villain on the other uh, uh, side of this. It doesn't get much better than, than Donald Trump uh, as, a, as a villain. Um, and that was a case that uh, got quite a bit of attention, given who Mrs. Koking was, who Donald Trump was and is. Um, and that was a case that first started putting this uh, issue in the, in the public spotlight. Uh, we were able to secure a victory for that. Um, so not only were we able to get some attention to the issue, but um, we were also able to secure a legal victory where a court, for the first time in, in probably several decades, uh, struck down the use of eminent domain uh, on on public use on public use grounds under the uh, under a, uh, the New Jersey Constitution. After we did that case, we learned about the extent of the problem. Uh, people were calling us from throughout the country, saying, "Hey, this isn't just some isolated case in New Jersey. This is happening in." my neighborhood, this is happening in my city, and we need your help. And we realized that this was not just isolated examples, this was a nationwide problem, so we made this a major part of our litigation uh, program. But we faced some challenges in doing so, one of the main ones being that the story arose on a local level, and so it was tough to get national attention for the issue, because it was Vera Koking in Atlantic City, or Suzette Kilo in New London, or a battle down in, in Mississippi, or out in Mesa, Arizona. So you had these little pockets of, um, uh, of problems, but it was hard to get a national uh, focus on this. The other thing that we um, recognize in trying to raise awareness of this is that reporters would oftentimes say to this, especially the national reporters, is that, well, we've heard about this, we're hearing more about this, but um, what are the numbers on this? How often does this occur? Um, it seems like there, there might be a, a national story here, but, but um, we don't know. Do, what, what do you know? And there were no numbers out there. Nobody was compiling statistics about this. Nobody was uh, documenting the extent of the problem. So we uh, uh, made it a part of our mission to put together a study that took us over two years to complete, which was the first ever attempt to document uh, nationwide the extent of this problem. Uh, we published this in, I think, uh, 2000 and, uh, 2003, um, and it documented over 10,000 instances of already completed or threatened condemnations for private development purposes in 41 states. Uh, and this was able to generate a lot more interest in this story, because people could then document the extent of the national problem. Reporters could look at their states and say, wow, our state is really bad in this area. Our state is actually uh, uh, pretty good, and um, it really raised awareness of this because, quite frankly, most people were not, even, was not, were not even aware that this was going on. And when they were aware of it, they were most often outraged about it and could not believe it was actually taking place. This study actually was instrumental in uh, getting us a uh, piece on 60 Minutes. And the 60 Minutes piece aired actually one year to the day before the U.S. Supreme Court accepted uh, the Kelo case. And this was really the first instance that this case was put into uh, the national spotlight. Mike Wallace did a story that was very critical of the use of eminent domain for private development. It, it focused on two of our cases uh, and clients, and it really got people quite upset about this. And in um, and, uh, uh, 60 Minutes, it said that they uh, got one of the uh, best responses they ever had for a, uh, for a story uh, uh, because of uh, people being being quite upset about what uh, the cities in, in these areas were doing to, uh, uh, to homeowners and to, uh, and to small business owners. Um, of course, nothing got more attention to this issue than the court accepting and then eventually deciding the Kelo uh, case. Uh, this was uh, really took this issue to the next level, and now just about every reasonably well-informed person in the country is aware of this issue, and as polls show, Virtually everybody is opposed to these types of takings. And this cuts across uh, geographical divides. It cuts across political divides. People in red states oppose eminent domain for private development as much as people in, in, in blue states. And it led to this 
backlash against the Supreme Court decision that's manifested itself in state court decisions, in uh, legislatures where uh, now 40 states have changed their eminent domain laws uh, in response to the, uh, to the Kelo decision. It's led to a, a change in the public climate about this where developers and local officials were oftentimes able to get away with this under the radar screen. Now people are more aware of it, uh, more uh, uh, willing to fight against it, um, and city officials, I think, and developers are much more reluctant, at least in many places, uh, to engage in this type of behavior. So th I think that is a classic example of l losing uh, a, a court battle, because the Kelo case, as most of you know, was a narrow five to four loss, but then beginning to win the overall war and the um, working with the media and, 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 and raising public awareness of this was a vital part of our mission in doing so. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Steve? <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Uh, well, for better or for worse, uh, the ACLU does not seem to have much trouble attracting public attention <laughs> to its cases. Um, being the uh, third speaker on the penultimate panel of a two-day conference uh, reminds me of the uh, old saying that everything that needs to be said has been said, but not everyone has said it. Um, <laughs> so um, I, I will try to the extent that I can to, uh, to avoid repetition and um, in the service of that goal, let me begin with uh, one clear answer to a question that was raised at the beginning of the panel, uh, which is, I, uh, I s suppose that the domestic surveillance program could be framed either as a national security issue or as a, <laughs> a massive abuse of civil liberties, but the right answer is it's a massive <laughs> abuse of, uh, of civil liberties. Um, the, um, uh, the, so strategies that we employ um, uh, at the ACLU are very much like the strategies that uh, Scott was uh, uh, talking about and that the Institute for Justice employs and that, uh, truth be told, uh, many public interest organizations across the political spectrum uh, now employ. Uh, Scott said something uh, that was interesting and I just want to pick up on, which is he said, well, you can lose in court uh, and still lose in, in, in a court of law and still win in the court of public opinion. Uh, that is certainly true. Uh, but the opposite is also true, and that has been an even more painful lesson, I think, for many public interest lawyers, which is that you can win in the court of law uh, and lose in the court of public opinion. Um, and, and if there are two uh, sort of signature uh, lessons that uh, I think the public interest community uh, has learned over the years, they come uh, from two of the uh, most important uh, civil liberties and civil rights decisions that the Supreme Court uh, has has issued uh, in the 20th century. Uh, the first, of course, was Brown versus Board of Education. Brown versus Board of Education was the culmination of of, uh, of an effort that um, had gone on for many decades. Uh, and I think there were many people uh, who, in uh, 1954, uh, really thought that the battle over segregated segregated education had been won. Uh, and that uh, it might take a few years uh, to achieve integrated integra uh, education, not only in the South, but throughout the country. But we now had a piece of paper uh, from the United States Supreme Court saying separate educational facilities were inherently uh, unequal. Uh, and the war was really over. What was left were, were a few skirmishes. And we, of course, know uh, that that is not true, that sometimes what Supreme Court uh, decisions can provoke is not compliance. And Kilo may be a, uh, another example of this, but but kind of a massive uh, political and public uh, backlash. Uh, and now, uh, what is it, 53 years later, we are continuing to fight uh, many of the same battles that were fought in Brown versus education, not only in the political arena, but back again in the United States Supreme Court. Likewise, um, with Roe v. Wade. Uh, when Roe v. Wade was decided in 1973, that one seemed even more clear cut. You had a decision from the Supreme Court that said state laws criminalizing abortion uh, were unconstitutional, and women uh, had a basic and fundamental constitutional right to control their own reproductive choices. Um, the ACLU, uh, in the wake of Roe v. Wade, uh, created uh, something that we called our Reproductive Freedom Project, 
Um, and we thought that um, we would have a reproductive freedom project for two or three years to uh, engage in what was described as mop-up work, um, to just go around the 50 states and, and, and deal with, with, with state laws that remained on the books, uh, but that were inconsistent with the Supreme Court's decision um, in Roe v. Wade. And here we are 34 years later, and uh, our reproductive freedom project is still there um, and busier and busier than it has ever been. Uh, I think the lesson that we have learned from that in the public interest community um, is that the fight for civil liberties, the fight for civil rights, the fight for human rights um, is largely a political struggle. That litigation is one advocacy tool within that larger political struggle, but it is not the only advocacy tool. Uh, and if you focus on it to the exclusion of other advocacy uh, methods, uh, you do a detriment to your cause and to your client. Uh, and so in the ACLU, we have three program departments. We have a litigation department, which is what I am in charge of. Um, but uh, we have a legislative uh, department. Um, and we have a very large and sophisticated uh, communications department. Uh, the communications department deals not only with uh, the media, uh, traditional and non-traditional, um, but we also now increasingly try to find ways to frame our own message. So like everybody else, we have a website. Um, we have our own blogs as well as contributing to other blogs that are out there. Uh, we have even in the last two years started to produce our own television show um, that we call The Freedom Files that's available on Link TV and has been available uh, to some degree uh, on PBS stations around the country. And all of that is an effort um, as Kim said, I think to, um, to frame the issues in, we think, in a way that we think um, uh, is, is, is appropriate. Um, one of the things that we have also uh, learned over the years, um, and this was a, uh, uh, um, you know, a, a lesson that, that uh, took us longer to learn than it probably should have, is that uh, lawyers are not always the best public spokesperson <laughs> people, and even, uh, even lawyers who are good at it need to be trained. Uh, at how to be good at it. And so one of the things that um, uh, we say at the ACLU all the time is that we would never send a lawyer into um, uh, court uh, without preparing that lawyer, without mood courting them, without making sure that, that lawyer uh, had anticipated the questions uh, he or she was likely to be asked and, and, and knew what the responses were. And we were sending people off to the McNeil era show and to the nightly news with absolutely no preparation whatsoever and no understanding that it was a different form and a different vocabulary and a different language uh, that they needed to engage in. Um, we no longer do that. Uh, we now make sure that the people who appear in public for the ACLU um, uh, have been trained uh, to perform um, uh, to perform that that function um, one of the things that uh, struck me uh, in the comments that um, have been made over the last uh, last couple of days and actually actually pretty much in, in this today's today's panels uh, were was first a, a comment uh, by Sergio Quintana the local local reporter from Raleigh Durham who was describing Duke's uh, reaction and response to the Duke lacrosse team and he said uh, I admired their principle I admired the the principles I admired the eloquence of their rhetoric what they didn't understand is they were in the knife fight um, and uh, likewise um, during the panel on crisis management um, uh, part of the advice that we got uh, was that in the middle of a crisis, perception is more important than reality. Um, uh, both of those things may be true. Uh, Duke was certainly in a knife fight, um, and there may well be many circumstances in which perception is more important than reality. Having said that, I have to say, I find both those observations very personally difficult uh, in my interactions with the press uh, because I am not inclined or disposed to want to pick up a knife. Um, and I um, happen to believe that reality is important um, <laughs> and that facts matter. Uh, that we have obligations to our clients, certainly, but we're not merely engaged in a process of spin, uh, and that we have some obligation to the truth, and we have some obligation um, both as a matter of institutional and personal integrity 
uh, to be honest about what is going on and how one shapes that message when they're in the food fight and everybody else has picked up their knives and everybody else is engaging in personal attacks is often a very, very difficult problem when you're in the middle of it. And frankly, there are some news outlets um, that I personally simply will not go on because I don't think they're interested in a serious dialogue or a serious debate about the issue. They want people to come and yell at each other. Uh, and I'm not particularly interested in being in that forum. I don't think it serves anybody's interest, mine, the ACLU's, or the public's interest, um, just to engage in, um, in that kind of debate. Um, let me make also uh, just two other comments about um, uh, uh, the issue of fair trial, free press, uh, although, as Chris said, neither Scott or I are primarily uh, criminal defense lawyers, and that makes a very big difference. We are plaintiffs, not only are we civil litigators uh, and not, not criminal lawyers, um, but we are by and large plaintiff's lawyers, not defendant's lawyers. And not only are we plaintiff's lawyers, but we are plaintiff's public interest lawyers, which means that um, the government, um, we are generally initiating litigation against the government. The government is not initiating litigation against us, or else we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> um, and because we are public interest lawyers, we have a certain latitude under the ethical rules that um, uh, uh, the traditional lawyers, not traditional lawyers, lawyers operating in, in, in for-profit law firms do not have in terms of our ability to go out and seek clients. So our ability to seek clients, our ability to, um, to initiate litigation gives us an opportunity at the very outset I think, that criminal defense lawyers often do not have to shape the story. The way a criminal uh, case is normally shaped is the DA stands on the steps of the courthouse and announces the indictment and the criminal defense lawyers are always playing catch up. We, on the other hand, um, have chosen our clients, have framed our complaint, are in control of the timing and generally have the benefit of the first press release and the first press conference. Uh, and that makes an enormous difference in being able to get, uh, to get your story, story out there. Um, Kim, uh, the few quick points I wanted to make on, two quick points I wanted to make, though, on the fair trial free press issue, was, was, was Kim, I think, made a very, very important point, and that is that there has been a lot of discussion at this conference, and understandably so and correctly so, uh, about the media's resort to stereotypes in the way that they covered the Duke lacrosse case uh, and how damaging that was and how unfair those stereotypes turned out to be. All of that is true, but what is equally true is that the stereotypes that were at play in the lacrosse, uh, Duke lacrosse case were the opposite of the stereotypes that dominate most media coverage of the criminal justice system. Uh, and therefore, um, they present a somewhat distorted picture of the problem that we face when we talk about how the media covers the criminal justice system. The other thing that I think has to be said, uh, and Letitia Falk touched on this very, very briefly during her talk in the last, in the last panel, is as a concerned as I am about um, the sensationalism and the pack mentality and the lynch mob mentality that can develop in these high profile criminal cases, whether at Duke or, Duke or elsewhere, that is a minuscule, minuscule proportion of the cases that go through the criminal justice system. And I ultimately, am concerned, but less concerned, about prejudicial publicity in these high-profile cases, because often these high-profile defendants, truth be told, have the ability to, 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 to deal with it themselves, then the criminal justice story is the media is not covering at all. And those are, are I mean, there's, a, there's virtually an endless list. And as Letitia said in the last column, what, what the prosecutorial misconduct that took place in, do, in, 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 this, in this situation was egregious, but it was not unique. And where, the, where is the media, even in the wake of the Duke lacrosse story, writing stories about going through the, 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 the um, North Carolina appellate decisions, looking for all of the other cases of prosecutorial misconduct, and said, what happened to those prosecutors in those cases? You know what happened? They went back to their jobs the next day, and they continued to do their jobs, and nobody said anything. And if the defendant was lucky, he got the conviction reversed, and maybe the defendant didn't get convict his conviction reversed at all, despite the prosecutorial misconduct. And if you want to know why there are wrongful convictions in this country on, an, on a daily basis, very little of that has to do with media misconduct or prejudicial publicity. It has to do with unequal resources. It has to do with an, um, an underfunded indigent defense system. It has to do with a punitive sentencing system that forces people into pleas because they can't risk going to trial. 
Those are the real stories of the criminal justice system, and those stories are not being covered in the media at all. And so when we think about media coverage, I think we have to address those issues as well as the question of pretrial publicity. Okay, thank you. Fair enough. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got some time for, for questions or comments. Yes, sir. I harken back to Mr. Haddon's comment about fear of the wall. How do you deal with tough questions, ones which may put you to a situation where you may you're, you have to ask, do I have to make a concession here or admission against interest, even just about some fact or some uh, interpretation of case law or something like that? And then secondly, and this is a different question, to what extent do you have to be concerned about violating the prohibition about materially tainting the potential pool of jurors or potentially tainting uh, the judiciary or something like that. Well, we rarely, for the, in response to the second question first, we rarely have to worry about that. Most of our cases are civil cases um, and, and really are tried by, decided by judges uh, because you're really challenging the constitutionality of, of a law uh, or a regulation, and, uh, and judges have to make those, uh, those determinations. So you definitely have more uh, leeway in making comments to the press than you would in a, uh, uh, than you would in a criminal uh, situation. Um, the other thing, too, with dealing with hostile questions or or, or even sometimes hostile uh, reporters is that um, we uh, you know we, we train people on how to deal uh, with that um, we are, are just honest and as upfront as possible and then try to uh, especially when you're dealing with in a hostile form is to still try to get your message out respond to the question that that's asked but then also incorporate your SACO that we had talked about as well. Get it back out on, on get the debate or get the questioning back to the terms that, um, that you want it to be on and the messages that you want to send so you don't let a, for instance, a hostile reporter completely drive the, uh, uh, completely drive the, uh, uh, the agenda. <coughs> yes, sir. Good. I'm also a former prosecutor and I've tried cases in a lot of jurisdictions. It's extremely rare to see prejudicial uh, prosecutorial misconduct. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's sort of a, it, that's a, that's a sort of a wide concept. And there are different kinds of prosecutorial misconduct. I think it's a mistake to lump it all together. But that's my comment. Okay. My question relates to, to the two of you who train your people to go talk to the media. And, and earlier you were talking about frames of reference, a very important concept. When you train your people to go talk to the media, you've got your frame of reference you want to sell, but if you go and visit with Mike Wallace and we do your filming for 60 minutes, um, his frame of reference is going to be different than your guys' frame of reference. How do you deal with that in that training process? Uh, well, let, let me let me respond to your comment uh, uh, first, and 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 I agree with you. I think I think the vast majority of prosecutors uh, in this country do their role and do their role well, and 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 follow the rules. My sister was a career prosecutor. Um, the um, but I also think just to take the you know one example of prosecutorial misconduct that occurred here, and that's the failure to disclose exculpatory uh, evidence. There are certainly you know, a fair number of cases in which uh, convictions are reversed on Brady grounds, and what I worry about is there isn't often either enough attention paid to that by the media or enough disciplinary action taken by bar associations or prosecutorial offices when their own ADAs or whatever, whoever it may be engage in that misbehavior. I don't think it's the norm, I think it's the exception, but it's, it, it happens enough that we ought to be paying more. It's not just this case was my, uh, was, was my only point. Uh, and, and, and your answer uh, about, uh, your question about the, the media is, exact, is exactly right. You can go in with your frame of reference and the journalist uh, the, or reporter is likely to have his or her own frame, uh, frame of reference. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it's not much different than when you are appearing in court and a judge asks a question and you have to try to answer the question as honestly as you can, but you always want to answer in a way that's most favorable to your client and enables that you to get back to the, the, the sort of thread of the argument that you wanted, uh, that you wanted to present. And I think that when you go in and you prepare for something like a 60 minutes interview, what you try to do, just as when you're preparing to go into court, is you try to anticipate 
um, what perspective Mike Wallace is going to bring into that interview room, what kinds of questions he's going to ask, and how are you going to respond when he, when he asks those questions. And if you're good and you're lucky, you're able to anticipate most of what is coming. And if you're not and you're surprised, um, then you've got to do the best you can under the circumstances. No, I, th I think that's exactly right. And you just have to look for the pivot. Right. You know, you have to take the question, answer it as honestly as you can, as, as you said, and then look for a pivot to bring it back to the points that you would uh, like to make. And there's little things, too, that that, uh, that we train people not to do, especially if you're doing TV interviews, where um, they ha they want to use the sound, you know, the, the sound clip, and there's just a, a brief thing, is that if you get a hostile question, you don't repeat the hostile question. In other words, if somebody isn't your client a liar? Say, no, my client's not a liar. You, Whoa, you, no, you just say no. And then, you know, they don't, it's so that it's not on, you, you're not then bringing up the fact that, uh, that uh, the, the, the accusation is that your client is actually lying or something like that. So it's little things like that that you do to try to avoid uh, getting yourself into, a, into that sort of uh, uh, hostile pitfall. No, it's not. It, it, it's actually not a Faustian exchange, and it's one of the things uh, because I think the answer is clear. I think the ethical answer is clear, uh, and it's something that I say to ACLU lawyers all the time, and that is that once we agree to take on the decision to take on a case, right, is a decision that we make in light of what the ACLU's principles are and the ACLU's priorities are. The moment we take on a case, and we have a client. Uh, we as ACLU lawyers are no different than any other lawyer out there who is representing their client. And that our first and only obligation is to represent that client as zealously as we possibly can. And if there's any conflict between the client's interests and the ACLU's interests, your obligation is to represent your client. And if the ACLU has to withdraw, they withdraw. But as long as you're that client's lawyer, you're that client's lawyer. And I think that's the only way um, that this system can possibly operate. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, we haven't looked at that particular part of it as carefully um, yet. And it's part of what we're trying to look at now is sort of sorting out. We've done a kind of quick thing about what kind of organization, who gets sort of directly quoted and on what side and how does that work out. Um, but now the next step is to sort of sort out those kinds of things. But it's certainly the case that the media will, right, going to opinion leaders makes sense because the media is going to quote those people too, right? So you're trying to get your message in one way. But that's the other way you get your message in, is that the media is going to pick up on those other opinion leaders and bring them in. Just one other quick thing I wanted to add, which is, which is a struggle that we sometimes have in the public interest world, which is, again, different than, than the issues that a criminal defense lawyer would, would face, is, is how to persuade the average person that the issues we are fighting about matter to them. And that's, that's, a, that's a different kind of conversation. How do you persuade the American public that what is going on in Guantanamo matters to them? They're not going to be imprisoned in Guantanamo. And so you, how do you frame that discussion so that people care about it? And that's an issue that we spend a lot of time thinking about and talking about as well. I mean, if I, if I yeah. could follow up on that, because I think ACLU is, 
probably more successful as a corporate than they are in Congress. That may be damning by faint praise. But, uh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, but, but one of the reasons I raised opinion leaders, um, and not just the big ones, not just you know professors at Duke, is the people, if, if you look at elections, the people who tend to be most successful at persuading somebody to vote a certain way are, are the opinion leaders within a community. You know, Joe, who's the influencer in, in, in the little block, um, and not necessarily a professor at Duke who is on um, it just seems like the Duke case is one where that was beginning to change the way in which the media functions. Yes, sir. <laughs> Many things are. <laughs> 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 that, uh, there's some media outlets that shed more people life. Um, Uh, let me be clear, the ACLU does not have lists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, I just, you know, I, I, I just think that, um, you know, there are a variety of, the, the, we now have niche media, it's part of the problem, right? People, people go to media sources that reinforce their own preconceptions, and that is, is, is part of the uh, reality that we all have to deal with. Um, but I think, um, you know, my view of this is, you know, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. If you're going to, if, you're, if your aim is to reach out to an audience and you're going to a forum in which you don't think you're going to be given a fair opportunity to express your message, you're not achieving anything in reaching that audience. And so you simply have to hope that those people, niche media notwithstanding, um, you know, are going to have access to your audience through through other outlets, and it it you, you're right. I mean, it may just mean that there were some people that we're not reaching, and we certainly don't want to be in a position of only preaching to those people who already agree with us. Um, but um, I, I I just I just think getting yourself in a situation where. Um, uh, you're being you're you're being invited to speak just so that you could be attacked without being given a fair opportunity to defend yourself doesn't do much to advance to advance your cause. That's just my view. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's not a thing wrong with a little bit longer than normal break. But <laughs> I just, Steve, add, I just want to add one other thing. Though. One of the things, and I don't know, Scott, if if you do this though, but one you know one of the things that we have tried now to do. Uh, is, is we've tried to actually sort of understand um, what issues and what messages um, uh, resonate with the American public. You know, um, our, our, our principles at the ACLU, I think, are pretty firmly set. Um, but we still are constantly trying to learn how to express those principles in a way that will be more persuasive. And one of the, the, the sort of interesting um, uh, little episodes we had was uh, when the, uh, there was a public debate going on about uh, whether or not the Geneva Conventions applied to people being held at Guantanamo, right? Uh, Alberto Gonzalez said they were quaint and obsolete. Bush said we weren't going to apply them to Al Qaeda. Uh, and there was a large national debate going on. I have to say my first instinct was to say uh, that the most powerful and persuasive argument you could make to the American public for why the Geneva Conventions mattered was because um, if we didn't obey the Geneva Conventions, then we sacrificed any moral authority to say that our soldiers were entitled to claim the Geneva Conventions when they were captured by the enemy, and that this was really about protecting our soldiers because the American public wasn't going to care about uh, people they saw as captured terrorists, right? That was my instinct. Turned out to be that that was not the most powerful and persuasive message. And it was not the most powerful and persuasive message because the American public was really more sophisticated than that. And they said to them, they said, it's not about reciprocity. Osama bin Laden is not going to follow the Geneva Conventions no matter what we do. <laughs> <laughs> 
And so, yes, we want our soldiers to, be a, to have the benefit of the Geneva Conventions, but we're not going to achieve that by saying to Osama bin Laden, we follow them, therefore you should follow them. Nonetheless, the American public felt overwhelmingly that the Geneva Conventions were important and that we should obey them. And the reason they thought that was because they said, we're better than they are. It says something about who we are as a society, right? And, and so partly, I think, what we are also all trying to do now, and this is part of the framing issue, we're, 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 we're becoming more sophisticated, I think, in, in, in sort of trying to understand um, what framing works and what framing doesn't work and why it works and how it works and to what audiences and maybe there are different messages to different audiences. And that all of that inquiry is not only an appropriate thing for a public interest lawyer and organization to do, but I think a necessary thing for a public interest organization to do. Yep. Let me um, ask you to do two things. One is uh, come back in 15 minutes for the judges panel. We haven't blamed the judges for very much yet. We'll get a chance to do that at 3.15. And the second thing is to uh, uh, give our panelists a round of applause.